All right, uh, so my name is Ashish. I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Limerick. And this is a second lecture in the data manipulation series by the Irish Software Research Center. So in this second lecture, we're going to look at how we can use Python to uh, deal with large amount of data or just use uh, any sort of data. So for example, uh, towards the end of this lecture, we're going to see how we can use Python to deal with CSV or Excel files. Right? So before I start, uh, I'm a final year PhD student at UL under the supervision of Dr. Jim Buckley. Uh, Jim took the last session on Excel sheets and how you can use software engineering to better process or write Excel sheets. I'm also a doctoral researcher at the Irish Software Research Center. Currently, I'm a visiting researcher at the University of California, Berkeley. I have been interested in teaching programming to non-CS professionals and students. I strongly believe that programming is a lot of fun, but a lot of people stay away from programming because of uh, the mathematical complexities involved. So as of now, I don't think it's required that you take a university level course to be able to write programs to help you deal with data or even automate daily process. All right, so today's agenda is, uh, we'll start with the brief description of uh, how computer programming works. So nothing too heavy uh, in terms of theory, but a basic understanding of how computer programming works. After that, we'll uh, look at why we should care about Python and why should we learn Python. Uh, and then what tools you would need if you, uh, start, if you want to start working with Python. And then we are going to look at basic building blocks of programming languages. The section four uh, is where we'll start coding in Python, but these basic building blocks apply equally to every other programming languages, right? So even if this lecture is mostly focused on Python, you should be able to use these concepts in other programming languages as well. And in section five, we are going to use whatever we have learned in four and read a CSV file that's basically an Excel sheet in our Python program and draw a diagram towards the end, draw a graph out of it. And towards the end of this session, I'm going to describe some best practices for writing your Python code. So again, this first session is to get you started with Python, is to show you that there's absolutely nothing to be scared of when it comes to programming in Python. It's just as easy as using Excel sheets and at times it's easier than uh, dealing with Excel. And once you're done with this lecture, in next session, we are going to use the Excel sheet that Jim used in lecture one and do everything that he did in Excel in Python. We're going to write our own code to perform uh, Excel related operations in Python in next lecture. So this is your building block and we are going to use this in our next lecture, right? Okay, so why learn uh, to program? Now, Excel is a really powerful tool, but it's designed for specific tasks. Excel is spe specifically good in handling tabular data. But if you're trying to do something uh, custom with Excel, it doesn't really work out as well. So consider an example. You have sales data of a supermarket, right? And you uh, have a task to find people who have bought 10 masks in the last six days that live within 10 kilometers of each other, right? So in order to do this in Excel, you'd have to create a new sheet, uh, sort all the addresses by the location, and then use a third party tool to find distance between uh, those two addresses. Now this, this if you were trying to do it uh, in Excel, would involve a lot of manual investigation, would involve a lot of uh, cells that you have to fill in on your own. But if you were to do this using a programming language, you could automate everything. Everything including fetching the distance using Google uh, Maps. So that's, that's just one example. So traditional programs uh, that we use, user end applications, are not designed to be very custom. Right? They're designed to fulfill some specific tasks that they're really good at. But if you're trying to do anything other than that, you'd have to spend a lot of time figuring it out. Now, uh, another use case for Python uh, is automation. You can automate almost everything that you do with your computers using Python. Now, one of the uh, issues that I had before I used to work with Python was renaming a lot of files. If you have a folder with 10,000 files and you'd have to just rename them for some uh, uh, purpose, then it's really hard to rename them. And you can, use a, uh, you can use a very simple Python script to automate that process of renaming. People have used Python scripts to do a lot more than just renaming files. People have written Python scripts that can uh, periodically check Amazon to see when the price of one particular product drops below a threshold and it will notify you at that point. 
So the basic idea is if you know how to program, you can automate almost everything that you do day by day related to computer, uh, computers. So if there's a repetitive task that you're performing over and over again, uh, the, it's more than certain that you can uh, automate that process using Python. Right? And another issue that I had with specifically with Excel was uh, related to dealing with really large amount of data. So if you have an Excel sheet with uh, hundreds of lines, it's pretty straightforward. You can use that uh, Excel sheet to manipulate data. But if uh, you have an Excel sheet with 10 million data entries, it's more than likely that your computer won't be able to handle 10 million data entries. So uh, usually what you would do is split that Excel sheet into multiple sheets and then deal with each of them. But uh, if you're using Python, you don't have to worry about really large amount of data. So even uh, big organizations that rely on a lot of data, such as uh, Facebook, Microsoft, they all at the back end use programming languages to deal with the large amount of data. Right? And another uh, aspect of learning programming language these days is that machine learning and artificial intelligence has come a long way from being, uh, being a topic of mathematical discussion to something that you can use in your daily life. And Python makes it really easy. So Python has a lot of pre-built tool that you can use for uh, machine learning or artificial intelligence application. Now, one good example would be, for example, if you have sales data and if you're trying to figure out what is the likelihood that you would sell this particular product in the next one month, then you can use Python, use machine learning, already built, already written code, and just plug in your data. And it's going to tell you based on your data what is the probability that you'll be able to sell this product in coming one month. Right. So uh, these are main reasons why I think everyone should learn programming because it's not that complex anymore. You can use pre-written code to perform almost all of the all of these tasks. Right. I'm going to try and see, uh, talk about predictive analysis towards the end of my next lecture and show how easy it is to use machine learning in Python. You don't have to know maths. You don't have to worry about uh, learning Python till. Uh, learning all the complexities involved with Python, it's pretty straightforward. Right. All right. So, uh, basics of computer programming. So, uh, I hope we are all aware of the fact that computers are just circuits, and at the core of each computer, uh, they work using binary language. So, binary language is basically zeros and ones. If a circuit is complete, it's one. If circuit is incomplete, it's zero. So, they rely on electronic pulses to make decisions. To, uh, to perform any task uh, on a computer. Now, most of these uh, binary operations heavily rely on something called Boolean algebra. Now, Boolean algebra has its root uh, in UCC, uh, specifically George Boole. Uh, fun fact, UCC is a part of Lero as well. So uh, we started with mathematics of Boolean algebra right, on and off, circuit complete or circuit incomplete. Then uh, we started implementing circuit to perform some specific task. For example, to add two numbers, eight plus nine, we had to create a circuit that could perform this operation and give us an answer. Then slowly we moved to journal purpose programmable circuits. Now the issue with circuits like this is that they can only add eight plus nine. They can, if you change eight to 10, it won't be able to perform that task because now you'd have to recreate a new circuit. This was a big issue during uh, World War II when uh, Britishers were trying to break encryption. They'd have to redesign that circuit within 12 hours and they weren't able to do it. So they came up with an idea of a general purpose programmable circuit. Now, rather than supplying or hard coding these values on your hardware, you use some sort of programming language to logically perform this operation. So we moved away from designing circuits to programming circuits. Now, most of these circuits use something called a machine code. A machine code is basically your binary code, zeros and ones, uh, that can tell your computer how to perform one particular operation. For example, for addition, you'd have a long string of zeros and ones that your computer can understand and perform an addition operation on. But this isn't very uh, easy for humans to understand or deal with. So we moved away from journal purpose programmable circuits to high level programming languages. So high level programming languages are very close to English. They uh, have a similar syntax. They have a similar uh, way of writing code. So this, this is easier. This is something that we humans can understand. So Python is an example of a high level programming language. Now we are going to write code in a language similar to English, but uh, it's 
it has a slightly different syntax that's specific to programming, right? So this is a basic history of how programming languages evolved over time. We moved from zeros and ones to machine learn, uh, machine code, then from machine code to high level programming languages. Now this is how a uh, high level programming language works, right? And this is not specific to Python. Every single computer programming language has to have at least these three components. The first component is you write your code. So this code again is a very high level, uh, in a very high level language similar to English, right? Once you write this code, you need a translator that can translate your high level uh, English code to a machine code, zeros and ones. Now this translator is known as a compiler. So in order to run any program, you write it in a high level language, you use a translator, a compiler to run it on machine. Right? So these are three basic components of any programming language. Now moving forward. So what is Python and why should you care? So uh, like I said, Python is a high level programming language. It's really easy to read and write. Uh, it's very similar to English. So the learning curve is very, uh, it's not steep. You can easily learn how to write in Python. It's widely used in both academia and industry. Uh, it's journal purpose, so you can use Python to uh, draw graphs. You can use Python to create websites. You can use Python to create mobile applications. If there's anything uh, that a computer can do, Python can definitely help you program that particular task. It's good for machine learning and data analytics. It's, it's the standard when it comes to analyzing your data. It has a really good community support. So if you ever run into an, uh, any issue, you can just Google it and uh, more than likely you'll find a solution. It's very easy to set up and get started with. So if you're new to computer programming, Python is a very uh, easy first step. Right? So what do you need to be able to run code in Python? So you need a text editor. So this the text editor will help you write Python code. Then you need a compiler that can translate that code to machine code. Now, like I said, Python is really easy to uh, set up. And the reason why Python is so easy is that it has something called an IDE. IDE stands for Integrated Development Environment. So in short, all of these steps are combined in a single tool that you just download and install, or you can use online resources, right? So in order to be able to run Python, you can use free online IDEs. In this case, I'm going to use Microsoft Azure Notebooks, but uh, please feel free to use any other tools. Just a heads up, if you're going to use any online Python IDEs, just be aware that uh, you're transferring your data to a third party sources. So if your company has any policies against uh, hosting your data somewhere else, please be aware of that. Again, if, if you cannot transfer sensitive data to other sources, you can always set up your ID on your own computer, right? I'm going to use something called a Jupyter Notebook. I'm going to describe what a Jupyter Notebook is, but uh, if you want to set up it uh, on your own computer, please feel free to use this link, right? All right, so this is where we start actually dealing with the programming language, right? So our aim in this section is to write a Python program that can store a student's name, student's age, and marks that student has obtained. So this can be three, four, five subjects, different subjects and their grades. And our aim is to calculate percentage of the student, right? So by the end of this section, we are going to uh, write a program that can uh, read a name, age, grades, and give us percentage in return. So uh, before I start, this is what a Jupyter Notebook looks like, right? Once you set up your Jupyter Notebook environment, this is what you would deal with. So each line of code that you write, so for example, if I write Python here, this is called a cell and you can execute your cell by hitting run. Now I have embedded these cells inside my presentation so we don't have to switch between Jupyter Notebook and my presentation over and over again, but basically it's just your Jupyter Notebook, right? Okay, back to this. So you can use your programming language as a calculator. Most basic example is you can perform addition. So eight plus nine, 17, now I can change this. And if I run it again, I get results. You can perform subtraction, you can perform division. Now multiplication is slightly different in Python. So you have to use a star symbol to perform multiplication rather than an X, okay? So these are, the, uh, these are basic mathematical operations that you can perform in Python. So you can use Python as a calculator. So that's first starting step. Now we wanted to calculate percentage of 
uh, a student, right? And we, let's say we have these four grades for a student. We can first calculate the sum. So we have used our calculator to calculate sum. And then we have calculated percentage for this particular student. Now we can use Python as a calculator and calculate these percentage, but it's not generic. We'd have to rewrite uh, for every single time. For example, if I were to change grades and signs, if I were to replace it by 42, I'd have to change uh, 227 to 224 again to get my percentage. Now Python can help us automate this process. And it's pretty straightforward. So we can create something called a variable in a programming language. Now this is first programming concept that you're encountering in this lecture. So a variable uh, is a placeholder. So this variable can hold this particular value, 45. And next variable can hold value 50. And then you can add all of these variables and store them in another variable called to do. So variable is basically a placeholder that can store some value. Every single programming language will have the concept of a variable. A variable can store some value inside it. And you can change that value over time, hence the name variable, right? And the reason why we use variable in programming languages it just makes it easier for us to know what this particular number refers to. For example, in this case, we were not very clear what true 24 war, uh, was referring to, but in this case, we are absolutely clear that it's referring to the total marks, right? We can also use something called a print function to print out the values. In this case, we are printing out the value of variable total. Now, variable total stores the sum of all these values. So that's our sum. Now I've created another variable called percentage. And in this case, I'm using total dividing it by 400 since we have four subjects and the total is uh, 100 each subject, so 400. And I'm calculating the percentage, right? So in this slide, you have learned what a variable is and how you can use a print function. So we use variable very frequently in any programming language, they store some value that can change over time. You can change that particular value. So in this case, the benefit is if I change 42, this is going to change the total. And if I rerun this, it's going to change the percentage. So now we have not hard coded this value. We have automated this process, right? And that's how variables can come in handy. So this is an example of a variable. Now we have different types of variables in programming languages, right? Now I'm going to describe a few of these variables. This is by no means an exhaustive list, but this is a, a good place to start with, right? So the type of value that a variable can hold decides the type of that variable. This is called a data type, right? So a variable that can store a number is known as an integer variable because it's storing an integer. Now, uh, integers store non-fractional values. Now this is specific to programming languages. It doesn't, uh, really reflect real world and Python doesn't necessarily differentiate between an integer or a fractional value, but this is a good uh, overview of data types in programming languages. Right? So we have an integer, integer is a non-fractional value, one, two, three, four, it can be positive, it can be negative. Then we have something called a floating point number. So this is a number with a decimal point. So 1.2, 48.99 and so on. So any fractional number, in programming language is referred to as float or floating point number. Then we have characters. Characters are single uh, alphabetic or numeric characters. Then we have strings. So strings are a sequence of alphabetic, uh, alphanumeric characters, such as the name. And then we have a lot of uh, other data types such as complex numbers and so on. You don't really have to worry about uh, other data types at this point. So whenever you encounter a different data type, for example, date, you can look into Python documentation and see how they handle date. They have a data type for date, right? So as of now, we're just dealing with uh, integers, floats, and strings, right? Now, another thing to note when you're looking at a data type is that every single data type has a number of operations that you can perform that depend on that type of data type. Now, to make it uh, more clear, think about a string. So this is my name. The string data type allows me to split this and just get the first three characters. So this makes sense in terms of a string if you want to just get the first three characters, but getting first three values of an integer doesn't really make sense, right? Uh, 
out of thousand if you extract first three values it doesn't really make any sense so each data type has operations associated with that particular data type so string would have some operations that are specific to string okay okay so coming back to our example we have name we have age percentage and result now we can check the type of these different functions right okay so let's have a look at name if you run this it's of type string str now we can also check the type of age it's of type integer right uh, we can check the uh, check type of result it's again string now you you would have noticed something that i've declared strings using two uh, quotes in the first uh, variable and in the second variable i've used a single quote it doesn't really matter when uh, you do this with python but one thing if you are trying to store a string you have to do, you have to use quotes that's how python knows it's a string right okay so again here i've used a function called type so this type is a function that comes with your python uh, distribution your python ide that can tell you different types of variables so in this case this variable is a string so far we have looked at what a variable is different types of data types we have looked at integers floats characters and strings okay moving on so now now we can uh, deal with different numbers so if you look at this example we have different variables of type integer but wouldn't it make more sense if we could combine all of these to a single uh, value right in a single data type so if if there's a complex uh, if there's a collection of different data types that makes sense to have as a single unit you can use something called a list a list data type is a collection of different objects or different data types so in this case you can create a list of marks that you have uh, for this particular student now if you print out the type it's called a list right so the use of list is it's a slightly more complex data type that can store a number of different uh, data types inside it so in this case this list stores four integer but you could also have integer string and so on so a list is a collection of different data types or same data type right so in order to access elements inside your list now this is a programming uh, languages can get slightly confusing they start their count with zero so if you're trying to read first value this is at zeroth position this is at first position second and third right so how do we read value out of a list you specify the location of value that you're looking for in this case results by subject you have to print results by subject and you have to print the zeroth position so zeroth element in there so the zeroth element is 45 that is how you can use uh, access elements inside the list and similarly you can access first element and so on so one thing to note here is in python whenever you're trying to uh, whenever you're using a list or a collection of different variables the reference is usually from 0 onwards so even though it has four elements you start with 0 1 2 and you end at 3 right so this is uh, something well uh, not worth the right okay moving on so again we created a list but it wasn't really uh, very easy to understand we didn't know which grade was referring to which subject so we don't really know what 45 means in our context so you can use something called a dictionary a dictionary you can think of a dictionary as a more advanced list that is easier to understand for end users in this case we have Uh, assigned a key to every single value so a key is basically an identifier it it describes what this particular value means so in this case we have grade for science set to 45 grade for math set to 50 and so on and you would have noticed that there is a difference between how you declare a dictionary uh, and how you declare a list in a dictionary you use a curly brace that's the only difference right so we can print the type in this case the type is a dictionary and in order to access elements now you don't really have to deal with the count 0 1 2 3 and so on you can actually use your key in this case i'm trying to find results by subject for computer science so if you hit enter you get your result for computer science 
So this is how dictionaries can make your program more human readable, can make your program easier to understand. So all we have done so far is created a new variable called results by subject of type dictionary that stores all of our subjects and their respective grades. Right? And if at any point you're confused uh, what is the data type that you're dealing with, use the uh, function type. Okay, so this is what we have so far. Uh, we have our name, we have age, and we have results uh, by subject, but our aim was to calculate percentage, right? So now we have to read each of these elements, calculate total marks, and then use our percentage formula to get the percentage out of this. Any doubts so far? So we have looked at variables, we have looked at data types, we have looked at uh, different operations specific to each data type. Then we looked at more complex data types such as list and dictionary. Uh, if you have any types, please feel free. Uh, if you have any doubts, please feel free to use the chat section. If not, I'll continue on. All right. Okay, so uh, now that we have results by subjects, we can calculate the percentage, right? We know how to write results by subject. We know how to make it more human readable. We know how to make it easier to understand. So we are comfortable with this one line. But how do we read this? This is not, uh, this is not a single value that we can just sum up. We cannot use plus symbol here to add these values. So this is where another important programming concept, uh, concept come, uh, comes into play, which is known as a loop. So whenever you have to repeat a process sequentially, right? whenever you have to repeat a process over time, you can automate that. In this case, we'd have to read this value, then read this value, and then sum these two values up. And the result that you get, you'd have to sum that up with this, and then again repeat the process for last one. So you're sequentially repeating a process over and over again. If there's a repetition, you can use a loop to automate that process. Now, in this case, it's very straightforward. So we are going to use something called a for loop. A uh, for loop is a type of looping construct in almost uh, all major programming languages, but I wouldn't worry much about understanding the syntax of this, right? So for every subject, inside results by subject, we have to print that particular subject. So this is a variable that we are creating at runtime. So whenever you execute this code, you're creating a variable called subject. This subject is going to assign itself to first science, then it's going to assign itself to maths, biology, computer science, and so on. So you can actually print this. Now, if you run this, you can see that uh, every single time it's going to print from there. So let's see. Now in this case, for science, you have 45 marks. And how did we do it? Since it's a dictionary, we can just pass in this particular subject and it will know which value to look for, right? So the main thing to understand in this slide is how to use a for loop. If there's a repetition in your code, you can easily automate it using a for loop. And a for loop needs a variable. This variable will automatically assign itself to science and value 45 and then maths and then biology and then CS and so on. So it doesn't really matter how many values you have in your results by subject dictionary, your for loop can automatically process it. Even if it's in millions, your for loop can automate that process, right? Okay, so again, we wanted to calculate the percentage, right? So every single time that we read science or maths, we want to uh, add it to a variable called sum. Now this, this is where uh, it gets slightly mathematical. So the idea is, I'll explain. So for once we have 45, right? We want to add it to 50 and whatever result uh, we get, we want to, for example, in this case, we get 95, then we want to add 95 to 52, right? So we want to process this sequentially. We want to add first two values and then add the result of first two values to third value then add the result of first three values to fourth value, right? And how do we do it? We again use our for loop because our for loop can read each values one by one. Now it's going to, for every subject and results by subject, it's going to uh, print subject first, and then it's going to calculate sum. 
Now, however, uh, I've start I've created a new variable of type integer, which is set to zero. So if you get a result of zero at the end of your execution, you know your program did not work because the sum should not be zero. So usually if you're creating a variable for temporary time duration, you would keep its value to something that you wouldn't expect your output to look like. For example, a negative value at this point, right? So if you get that value, you know there was an error with your program. I set it to zero. Now, sum in the first iteration, so it's going to uh, execute this code four times because we have four values. So the first time it executes this value, sum, sum is equal to zero because we have set sums value to zero plus result by subject. So in this case, result by subject is 45. So the final value of your sum is 45. Again, every single programming language executes any uh, logical statement or any mathematical expression starting from right side towards left. So it's first going to perform this operation, mathematical operation and assign its value to sum, right? So from right to left. So in this case, uh, in first iteration, it's going to assign value 45. And let's just have a look at that. So after signs, the value of our sum is 45. We have printed value of sum. After reading in maths, the value is upgraded to 95. And after reading biology, 147 and 227, right? So this for loop is sequentially reading each value and we're using this sum to store the sum of our values. Is, is this concept clear? So the idea is we can use our for loop to read values sequentially, one by one by one and so on, right? So we can automate this process of sum. Okay, now we can easily calculate our percentage. We have done this before. Okay. In this case, we are passing in our value of sum and just using our percentage formula. So we have a percentage. Now. We moved away from creating one uh, variable for each of subjects to just creating one dictionary and using a for loop to automate this process. So we have moved from a very manual approach to calculating percentage to somewhat automated approach, right? Now, what if we wanted to add another subject to our dictionary? Let's say I wanted to add results of history. I forgot to add them initially. So if you add results of history, our sum logic will still work well because there's no hard-coded value. It's going to repeat this process now five times and initially it repeated it for four times. So it's automatically going to understand that it has to repeat it another time. So we do have a sum of 292. Can you identify any issues with our percentage value in this case? So you can see that our percentage value, this division, is hard coded as 400. This should be upgraded to 500 because now we have five subjects and total marks is out of 500, right? So this percentage value is wrong. Again, we can automate this process as well using our programming uh, using Python and never have to worry about how many subjects we have in order to calculate percentage. So you don't have to worry about changing your mathematical formula every single time you add or remove a subject or change a grade for that matter. Right? Okay, so how do we do it? Now, this brings me to another important concept of programming, which is called a function. We have already looked at a print function. We have already looked at a type function. So basically, a function is a bunch of code that only runs when it is called. You can often pass values to functions. So for print function, we always pass something we wanted to print out. So that's how a print function works. We have two main types of function. We have predefined functions and we have user-defined functions. Now, a function is what really makes programming languages useful these days. Now, rather than reinventing the wheel every single time, we can use predefined functions. We can use code written by other people and just call that function to perform some operation. So in this case, whenever we used print, we didn't have to explain our computer how to show values on a display because that's something uh, that people who develop Python have already done for us. So we don't have to deal with it, right? So we can use a lot of predefined functions to perform almost uh, all that analysis operations that you need to perform. You don't really have to write your own function. This is what makes programming languages really powerful. You can compare this to uh, the menu bar that we have on Excel with different functionalities. 
But in case of Python, the functionalities are endless. You can use uh, code written by other people for almost every single task that you can think of. So you don't have to repeat the process. In this le lecture, we are going to just focus on predefined functions, right? And in the next lecture, we are going to write our own function, which are called user-defined functions. Okay, so for predefined functions, again, the issue that we ran, uh, ran into was that we had to hard code this value of 400. Now, the easiest way of solving this would be if we knew how many subjects there were in results by subject. And if we knew there were five subjects, we could just multiply it by 100 and get the total sum, right? That's an easy way of automating this. So in order to find out how many elements you have inside your results by subject, you can use a function called length. So L-E-N is short for length. It's a predefined function in Python. So whenever you install a Python uh, distribution, you get this function pre-built. So now we can use print length of this particular dictionary. So it's going to return five. Now we can get back to our example and automate this process. Now you can see I've calculated length of results by subject and have multiplied it by 100. So in this case, it doesn't matter if I have uh, five subjects or four subjects. So you can see I'm going to remove this and rerun this. So now it has automatically updated the percentage. So we don't really have to manually embed anything. You can include subjects, you can remove subjects, you can change grades, it's automatically going to understand what to do with it, right? So we have automated this process of calculating percentage. And so what have we learned so far? These are basic building blocks of programming, right? So the first concept that we, that we looked at was a variable. What do we mean by a variable? A variable is a programming construct that can store some value for you. Now there are different types of variables and we define them using a concept known as theta types. We looked at integer, we looked at string, and we looked at characters. Uh, and then we moved to some complex theta types such as list and dictionaries. Lists are useful when you don't have to give description to every single entry. Dictionaries are useful when you need description for every single entry. For example, in our use case for results by subject, we need a description for each grade. So we used a dictionary. Then we looked at how to read these complex data types using a loop. So we looked at the concept of looping. The looping is what actually helps you automate the whole process of repeating same task over and over again. Then we looked at how to use predefined functions. So far we have looked at print, that's a predefined function. Then we looked at type, and then we looked at length. All right, so that's it for basic building blocks of programming. Now in next sec uh, next section, I'm going to uh, look at how we can read CSV files, right? So the purpose of this next section is to show you that Python isn't scary. You can use it to perform, you can use it to, for example, draw graphs uh, using your X. So if there's something you did not understand uh, through this lecture, I have documented uh, most of my source code uh, inside the GitHub link, right? So if you use the binder link, you should be able to see documentation with every single piece of code. So you can modify this code and execute it on your own to see how it works. So if there's something you didn't understand through this lecture, you can always come back to this resource and change, make changes and see how it works. The best way of learning programming languages similar to any other language, you just have to practice it. You don't have to uh, do something too complex, but if, if you're trying to perform a very basic operation, just keep practicing writing the same code over and over again, and it doesn't take long before you get good at it. All right, so if there are no other questions, I'll start with the next section. All right, so in this next section, we are going to read a CSV file. So a CSV file is basically this. This is what I'm going to read. Let's see if I can zoom it up. Okay, so this is a very simple Excel sheet with name of student, age, and his grades in five subjects, right? And my aim now is to automate reading this file and calculating percentage. Now in this case, I just have one entry, but it doesn't really matter. Even if you have millions of entry, you can always use your for loop to automate same process. So the idea is you just have to write your logic once, use for loop to automate repetition. Okay, now coming back to this. So uh, 
a sample CSV file for a student. We need to open this file using Python. After opening this file, we need to read it. Uh, now, once you have read it, you can calculate the percentage and display it using a print statement. All right, moving forward. So reading files in Python is a problem that's uh, very common. So if you're ever, so it's something that people deal with on daily basis. So you don't have to rewrite logic of reading files. That's what I was talking about uh, in terms of functions. So functions are pieces of code that are frequently used. So you don't have to reinvent the wheel. You don't have to rewrite any of that. Now there are many functions that serve somewhat similar purpose. For example, a function to draw a, uh, a circle and a function to draw a triangle could easily be combined into a library that draws different shapes. So a library in Python is just a collection of functions that perform somewhat similar tasks, right? So rather than going on the internet and looking for a function to draw a triangle, you can just use a library that has all of these different geogra uh, geometric shapes in it, right? So a library is just a collection of a lot of functions that perform somewhat similar tasks. Now, in order to read and draw the diagram, we are going to use two libraries. So we'll start with the first one. So to read our CSP file, we will use a library called pandas. Now this is a widely used data manipulation library in Python. And moving forward, if you have to ever do anything with data in Python, you'll definitely have to use pandas. So pandas is a very popular data manipulation and analysis library. This is widely used in machine learning, data analytics uh, field. It has a lot of predefined mathematical operations related to data manipulation, one of which is reading CSV files, right? So a CSV file is just a simplified version of an Excel sheet. Uh, if, uh, so just to make it clear, you could use pandas to read an Excel sheet as well, a pure Excel sheet. All right. Okay, so in order to use a library, we must first import it to our program. Similar to how in Excel, you'd have to go to the menu bar, click on insert, and then for example, insert a diagram, or in Word, how you would use insert to insert a table. In a similar manner, in programming languages, we have to import the library we want to use. In this case, uh, okay, so there's an error in chat. Okay, if you have an error that the module was not found, that's uh, probably because the pandas library is not installed on your uh, on your system. So it's I'll get back to how you can set up pandas. It's pretty straightforward, and most of IDEs have pandas pre-installed, so you don't have to worry about setting it up. All right, getting back to this. So import pandas. That that's how you import your library. And then in this case, I'm using a variable called students result, student results. It's going to go to pandas and then call a function called read CSV. So this is very similar to how you would get into a menu and click on a button, right? You have, you're going into your libraries called pandas and then clicking on a function called read CSV. So this dot is known as access specifier. So it's just specifying that inside Panda, you have to call a function called read CSV. And inside this function, you have to pass this file called result, uh, student results.csv. Now this is a file that I have uploaded to my Jupyter notebook. It's there. And you can uh, use the upload functionality to upload your CSV file as well. Now getting back to this, once you have uploaded your CSV file, you can always uh, print out this particular variable. So if you print it out, this should give you the value. All right, so I think my Microsoft, yeah, thank you. Yep, so you can see your results there. So now we have already read in this CSV file. So we have read in this tabular data in our Python and we can easily manipulate it however we want, right? So just to look at what type is student results, we can always use the uh, function called type. So type will give us the type of uh, this data, student result. So you can see that it's, it's a weird data type that we have not interacted with so far. So that's absolutely nothing to worry about. Almost all different libraries have their own inbuilt data types. So some data types are better in terms of their performance when compared to other data types. So 
If there's a data type that you have never interacted with, you don't have to worry. In this case, we know that this particular data type data frame is handling a tabular data. So if you can think of an operation that you can perform with a table, uh, this particular library pandas can definitely handle it. So at this point, if you interact with a data type that you have not seen before, use your intuition and see what are the logical operations that you can perform on them, and then read documentation. That will definitely have a function to perform the task that you wanted to perform. So in this case, we have uh, entries done for Luke. Now we just want to read these in, save name, save age, and calculate total and subsequently calculate percentage. All right. So here's a source code of how you can read these values in. All right. So student results, again, uh, read the CSV file in. Now, once you read this CSV file in, we can store it in a variable called Luke because we know that's the first student. Again, if you have more than one student, you can use a for loop and automate this process of reading uh, entries in, right? So student locations, inside student locations, there's a function called iLock. So this basically stands for locating, uh, locating entries inside your table. In this case, we are trying to locate zeroth entry. Again, what do I mean? So in this case, you can see this is the zeroth entry, right? If you were to use a for loop, this for loop would automate the process of zero, one, two, and so on, right? If that's clear. So if we look at zeroth value, we are going to get data for Luke. And now we, I can print this data. So print data for Luke. So what does Luke contain? So we know the data Luke contains uh, name, age, uh, and his grades. So we know zeroth location in this case is his name. So we can store it as name, right? And we know first location is his age. So we can store in age. Again, in programming, we always start with zero and then go on up until the end rather than starting from one. So that's something that's constant throughout uh, all major programming languages. So that's something you would have to get used to. All right, now we know uh, that subjects start from, uh, so this is zero, one. So subjects start from second entry up until seventh entry, right? So you can give a range as well, right? So rather than giving a single value, you can pass in a range. So I have passed in range from uh, two to seven. So everything starting from two till seven is uh, going to be a part of subjects. So now we can see subjects. Now let's just print out subjects. Now I'm going to re-execute it. And you can see that now we only have grades for subjects, right? So we have split our CSV file into different entries that are useful to us, three different entries. And again, we know how to calculate a percentage at this point. I'm going to use a for loop for each subject located inside subjects, calculate the sum, then calculate percentage. I'm going to use the length function and then just, just print percentage, right? Okay, so let's see if we get percentage value here. So you can see we can get the percentage. So if you change anything in a CSV file, it's automatically going to deal with it, right? Again, we can automate this process of uh, reading in files from our CSV. In this case, I just had one entry, so we only have one file. So that's one example of how you can easily read a CSV file and store it. It's really useful if you're going to repeat this same process on a large amount of data, right? Okay, moving on, how to draw a graph, right? So we already know how to read a CSV file. Now, uh, for, to read a CSV file, we use a library called pandas. In a similar fashion, we can use a library called matplotlib, so mathematical plotting library. So by using matplotlib, we can uh, draw graphs. So again, matplotlib is very complex. It has a lot of uh, graphing libraries. If you import every piece of code written in matplotlib, your code becomes slightly slower. But in this case, we know we, are, we just want to use the Python plot part of this. Now, this is something that you would get uh, from documentation. If you Google how to draw a graph in Python, they would easily point you to this particular library and this function, right? 
Now, rather than rewriting this piece of code every single time, right? matplotlib.py uh, plot dot something, I can give it an alias. So in this case, I have given it an alias called plot, plt, right? So again, uh, if your library is too complex, if the name is uh, pretty huge, you can always give it an alias. In this case, I have given it an alias called plot. All right, again, we read the CSV file, we store it into a variable called Luke, then we calculate subject, uh, then we extract subjects from our Luke variable. Now, in order to plot, we can use this PLT. So basically this PLT is referring to this library, right? So it's nothing complex. It's just, an, uh, just a shorthand of simplifying our uh, code writing process. So plt.plot, that's the method we are going to call and we, we just pass in subjects. So basically we are asking Python to use this library matplotlib to plot these subjects and we have a plot. So it automatically understood what you want uh, it to have on x-axis, what you want it to have on y-axis, and what type of graph you want. So Python can automate this process as well. Now you can draw different types of graphs. If you wanted to draw a histogram, you could replace this plot with hist, h-i-s-t, and that should do it. So if, if, you, if you want to use Python to draw graphs, have a look at matplotlib library. Right? It's almost always as simple as just passing in values. So in this case, we just passed in subjects. Okay, okay so that's it uh, on how to read CSV files and how to draw graphs. Before I conclude, I'll just uh, give a brief overview of how to write good Python code or what are best practices for writing Python code. Now, the first and uh, most useful recommendation is write a lot of useful comments on your code, right? So whenever you're writing uh, any code, it's important that you document what your program does because over time, uh, after six months, if you're looking at your own source code, more than likely you won't understand what it does unless you have comments explaining how it works, right? So it's really useful that you write a lot of comments. You should, you should also use uh, version control. Now this isn't something that I would recommend you have a look at straight away, but if you get a hang of Python and use it uh, to automate your processes, it might be good to have a look at version controls. So what version control basically does is it keeps a track of evolution of your program. If you change a line of code in your program, you can go back to your version control and look at past histories. So basically it takes snapshots of your program over time, right? Uh, you should also test your code frequently. So use basic uh, testing logic. So for example, if it's a program that adds to value, perform the addition with your hand and see if you get the same output as you expected. And if you need more recommendation, uh, you can always just execute import this statement inside any Python uh, IDE and it should give you a list of good ideas on how to code. Now, I do realize we are almost out of time so I cannot go through with this list, but it's pretty self-explanatory. You can read it, right? Okay, so if you have any other doubts, please feel free to ask it. Uh, if, you, if you run into any issues uh, after this session, please feel free to send me an email. And especially if you have issues with uh, installing any libraries, I am going to send a piece of code that you can use to install these libraries. Now, pandas and matplotlib should always be uh, there with your Python uh, installation. So it's not something you should worry about installing separately, but if it's an issue, you should use this command. So you can get it from chat. All right, so it's basically, uh, you're just telling Python to, I'll give you an example of how to install libraries. So use an explanation point and use PIP. So PIP tells Python that you have to install pandas. And that's pretty much it. If you run this, this will automatically install pandas if it's not already there. It should always be there, but if it's not, you can use this particular command. All right, so that's it for this session. Uh, so, Viresh, it seems like you already have pandas installed. Can you please check your spelling of pandas or look at your ID? So the, yeah, so if pandas is already there. That's why I'm not getting any, any errors. The, I assume pandas is always packaged with any Python library. All right, so again, uh, this is it for this session. I hope you uh, can have a look at uh, the supplementary material. And please feel free to change things 
try to experiment with the source code. That's how you can learn the, the learn any programming language. To be honest, you have to experiment with the source code, right? And in the next section, if you're still interested, I'm going to uh, implement a lot of new uh, methods in Python. So create methods that fulfill your own use cases. And then I'm going to slightly touch machine learning and show predictive analysis with Python. It's as simple as four lines, so nothing to worry about. Again, thanks a lot for attending this session. And I hope to see you in the next one. Have a good day.